welcome to yet another segment of the Ambank Biz Club Show. We're with Hannah Tan. Quibo is a group of companies that yep. you've started and yep. you've seven, eight different companies. Um, <laughs> tell us a bit about yourself. I mean, I, I know you have a very interesting background. You ran away from your house when you were yeah. 16. <laughs> you became valedictorian. Uh, you do uh, nothing of what you study now. You became a model, a singer. You went to Japan to be a singer. Uh, and now you're an entrepreneur with many companies. Tell us how it all began. Uh, how it all began. Well, uh, something that uh, <laughs> not many people would know about me is the fact that I'm actually an introvert. So what that... I, I just told her she's a liar. But okay, never mind. What that means <laughs> is that I get very uncomfortable in social environments and especially crowds. So even after 18 years in the industry, if I'm honest, Roshan, right now at this very moment, my heart is pounding, my palms are sweaty, and I feel like I just want to run off stage and hide. <laughs> Any of you guys feel the same? anxiety in front of crowds as I do. Okay, thank you. Thank you for making it. <laughs> okay, so, okay. so, so, so tell, tell us a bit, I mean, you know, you started at 16, you ran away from home, yeah. why? why? And, and then how did that trigger a journey of where you are today? Um, so, I come from a, a rather strict Christian family because my dad uh, was a pastor, he's a missionary now, and um, so growing up, we weren't allowed to watch TV. I wasn't allowed to go out with my friends. Um, even when my friends would call in, um, I would have to answer the phone on speakerphone. Uh, so obviously, no boys allowed. Um, so at the age of 16, I mean, I, I, I turned into quite a rebellious child. And at the age of 16, in the name of freedom, I decided to just pack my bags and run away from home. So if you're watching this, and if you're 16 and below, please do not do this. It was this, one of the silliest... This is where we need a sign not to be done at home. <laughs> exactly, because it was one of the silliest decisions I had ever made. So I ran away from home, stopped school. That time is 16 is from 4. Stopped school. And obviously, in order to survive, I needed money, right? Didn't think about that when I ran away from home, did I? So... Um, took a couple of odd jobs. I work in a hawker stall, uh, kindergarten, give tuition classes, um, piano lessons. I had already completed my first diploma by then. So I was technically qualified to teach. And so, you know, I was learning how to survive on my own at 16. So stubborn, so proud because I didn't want to go back and say, sorry, mom and dad, I can't do it. So proud, right? So at the age of 16, I learned the meaning of independence. And when I was 17, under the persuasion of my mom, I decided to take SPM as a private candidate. So the thing is that I had left school for more than a year, and I had left school as a pure science student. So taking as an SPM examinations as a pure science student um, wasn't easy. But miraculously, I managed to pass the SPM examinations with a grade one, and that gave me an entrance scholarship at a local college to undertake a technical degree. So they gave me the option of either computer science or engineering, and I had always wanted to do business, right? But that wasn't on the table, so I thought, okay, computer science, engineering, computers, the lesser of both evils. So what I didn't realize is that entrance scholarship, what does that mean? A college gives you an entrance scholarship means they want to entice you with a free uh, one semester, and then from there you have to pay on your own, right? So I thought, oh, someone's giving me something for free, yay! So an opportunity to study for free. What I didn't realize was that it was only valid for one semester, and in order to re-qualify the following semester to stay in school, what I needed to do was three things. So a student, in order to, to continue a scholarship for the next semester, would need to, number one, have a GPA of 4.0. Perfect GPA. Yes. Number two, fulfill as many subjects as a full-time student. So if you're a part-time student, then you, you, you can't do half. You need to do full. And the third thing was to maintain an active co-curricular portfolio. So what does that tell you? Number one, the owner of my college was Chinese. Number two, 
nothing in life comes for free. <laughs> so there I was, first semester, computer science, a subject that I had no clue, didn't have any interest in. But I knew that, you know, by society standards, you need to possess a paper qualification in order to survive, right? So time went by, and at that time, I was actually working nine to five in order to survive. And I had a full-time job and four other part-time jobs. The first part-time job was, I was working uh, part-time for a, a law firm, so I was typing affidavits for them. The second part-time job was I would work in the college as a part-time tutor. The third job was I would give um, tuition classes and piano lessons during the weekends. And the fourth job, I would like to term it as outsource student services. What I did was, if you've been in college, have you ever outsourced your assignments or dissertation to someone else? Thank you for contributing to my college education. So that was what I was doing. So 9 to 6, I would be in the office, 7 to 10 classes at night every day. And after that, I would go back, do assignments, write other people's assignments, um, and, and do whatever I could within those few hours. So within those years in college, I survived with two to three hours of sleep, sometimes with no sleep at all. And at the age of 18, I finally understood the meaning of exhaustion. <laughs> and at 18, I almost had a nervous breakdown. So life gives us exactly what we need practice in, right? I believe at that point of time, life decided that I needed practice in independence, Discipline, <laughs> resilience, never say die attitude. And in that precious two to three years of my life, I learned a very important lesson, learned to fight alone. If it doesn't challenge you, it doesn't change you. And sometimes I would feel left out because, you know, while my, 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 my college mates were hanging out in movies, going out to parties, and just hanging out, you know, there I was, you know, I couldn't even afford to, to have proper meals. I was eating instant noodles every day, yet alone, let alone, you know, buy my own textbooks. I couldn't afford it. So I was in the library referencing books there uh, for my assignments because I couldn't afford it. So I felt left out, but here's... But would you say that all these experiences, actually, the accumulation of all these experiences enabled you to start these businesses, or at least enabled you to, as you started these businesses, be resilient, be able to overcome a lot of the obstacles that came your way. Yeah. Um, and if you didn't have these experiences, many of your businesses wouldn't have succeeded. You're right. This was the foundation of, of, of what, what, what I built consequently, subsequently. So, so, the, so the model of have, ensuring that we fail, and fail early, and fail mm. as much as possible, yes. actually gives us benefit in the future in the long run. That's what you're, you're right. saying. You're right. Because we, you know, we so often we get so caught up in the illusion of success that we forget about the essence of the journey because success is what we attract by the person we become and the person we become is eventually shaped by a series of events and circumstances which are labelled as challenges or failures. But if we approach it with the right mindset, the more failures, the more challenges we're able to overcome, the better we become. And from there I learned two very important things in life, which you know, I applied later on. The first thing is discipline and, and, and habits. If we look at a point of time in our life where you know, uh, we had commitment issues, time management issues, or we were unable to achieve a goal or even a New Year's resolution, what does it all boil down to? The word discipline. It's just summed up in discipline. Because discipline is the ability to do something over and over again in spite of how we feel until it becomes a habit, right? So we are what we repeatedly do. And if we look at a person's habits, you'll be able to tell the person who is likely to succeed or not. And so I learned about discipline and I learned about habits. Um, and, and here's the thing, you know, with creating new habits, we always want to create new good habits, right? But it's not always easy. It takes 
what, 30 days for a change in behavior to become a habit and what, six months for a habit to become an automatic way a person does things. So small changes, small smart choices consistently over time equals to radical difference. I realize that when dealing with habits, the, the, the trick is to go for small and sustainable. Uh, break it down into bite sizes. If it's, if you can't see yourself doing something every day for the rest of your life, scrap the idea, uh, rethink, revise it. For example, if you know, we have a goal and we want to develop a habit to eat healthy, but we can't imagine ourselves eating steamed chicken breast meat and salad with no dressing every single day for the rest of our lives, then scrap the idea. How about starting the day right with, say, two eggs in the morning, you know, a healthy portion of fiber, and then have a portion of fruit before every meal and just scale down your portions. Is that more manageable? Can that be a start of a habit? So, so you can take that same concept to your business, right? When you drive exactly. change, look for incremental small changes, right. and the accumulation of that will give you the big change as, yep. in, in, as time goes on. You know, you know the other piece that, that's quite interesting is that you get a lot of business ideas in crisis. Yeah. Um, so one, one of the businesses you started is a fruit juice, uh, I guess it's fruit juice, or, or su a, yeah. a health supplement, Sure, right? it's a liquid supplement. Yeah, it's a liquid supplement. Mm -hmm. But this came because you had a very scare, you, you, know, you had a significant health scare. Talk us through that. Talk yeah. us how did that, that health issue result in a business venture for you. So um, the, uh, year, uh, the, the decade and a half of lack of sleep <laughs> actually took a toll on my health. And I think I was so caught up with the, the chase towards financial freedom that I was totally oblivious um, about my health. And, and the, the compound effects of a poor diet, lack of sleep, lack of exercise, and poor choices in lifestyle um, will not actually be so significant in the early years, in the first few years, but by the time it gets to your attention, it's usually too late. And that's what happened to me. So I found out you know, that I had kidney stones, things in my liver, um, ovarian cysts, brain tumor. <laughs> and uh, there was this. I, I, I was in Japan at that time, came back to renew my visa. And um, I went to the doctor, my gynae, and just scanned because I had been complaining of uh, stomach pains for like months and months and months and months. So I finally went, get it, got it checked, and then the, the gynae said, you have a couple of ovarian cysts. And under monitoring, they seem to have grown bigger. And I did a cancer marker test. It was positive. And gynae said, remove it. So I said, OK. Open surgery. So Gaini said, uh, well, it was supposed to be a 30 minute surgery, but it turned into three and a half hours because there were so many other complications, um, adhesions, and it was very ugly inside. <laughs> so um, when I was wheeled out of the OT, I was in pain, but you know, no morphine could, I couldn't, my body couldn't accept the morphine. And the doctor said, you'll be bedridden for a couple of days. But there was my Japanese boss calling me on the phone right after surgery. He's like, Hana-san, you know? <laughs> Why you not pick up phone, right? So it's like, that's, that's, that's the Japanese because, you know, they don't care whether you're in surgery or not. You know, you're supposed to be on the job. So I was lying in bed and um, bedridden, so helpless. <laughs> and then this uh, friend of mine came to visit me with this bottle, and it was a, a liquid supplement. And she said, you know, it helped her and um, her family member was suffering from colon cancer to recover. So I said, try this, ask your gynae whether you know, it's okay for you to take it. So I asked my gynae, gynae took the bottle, looked at it and said, oh, okay, this looks like um, intense vitamins, okay, you can take it at your own risk. So I thought, okay. So this friend of mine said, take one shot, one day, will help you to recover. So being Chinese, I thought, hmm, I take one shot every few hours, then I should recover faster, right? Right? So that's exactly what I did. And interestingly enough, on the second day, uh, the doctor said, you know, they could take the tubes out. And my wound, the, the open surgery wound, had actually started to dry up and shown accelerated signs of recovery. 
So I was like, wow, I should keep doing this, right? So I, I, I did that. And, and essentially what I was doing is I was putting this product to the test. And before you know it, I was back in, in Japan and I was performing. Um, but then that's another story because when I was in Japan, you see, when you have an open surgery, it's, it's essentially like a C-section, but without the baby. So you're supposed to take about a month to recover. But within the week, I was back in Japan because uh, my Japanese boss had actually arranged for 40 locations uh, for me to perform back to back. And I was in pain, right, with my scar and the, the stitches still there. And then my Japanese boss said, Hanasan, I don't care. you in pain, you perform and you sing and you dance like you contract to do. So there I was. I was performing on my Japanese debut tour and I had uh, internal bleeding as a result of that. <laughs> and then I had an occurrence of a few more other cysts. So that was when I thought, okay, oh, that product, let me, let me put that to the test again. So I did that and instead of going back for another surgery, I took that and within a year, not immediately, within a year, the cysts were gone. So I thought, wow, I am going to sell this product and market it to the rest of the world because it's a brilliant product. So I contacted the manufacturers and they said, uh, sorry, uh, we won't OEM it because you know this business is pegged to a charity foundation. It's a social enterprise. So I was like, oh. They said, but you can help us out. So I thought, okay, great. I've got a good product. I've got a good cause. Turn that into a business and help people set up businesses you know, with, with, with small franchise startups. So that's what I began to do, and that's what I'm still doing today. So, <laughs> so, so I mean, you, you know, a, a lot of your lessons are very personal, and, you know, a lot of things, you know, actions has caught, caused consequences. Yep. And if, 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 you know, why, why did you end up going into showbiz? Why, why, I mean, you clearly had a heart for business. Mm -hmm. You know, you've always had ideas. You've always got a ton of ideas. And then you, you took a detour and ended up, you know, going to modeling, going into <laughs> singing, you know, going uh -huh. to Japan mm -hmm. to, to have concerts. Um, was that intentional or is it something that just happened? And, and how did that, you know, how did that affect your business and how did that affect you as an entrepreneur? I think for me, uh, because I came from a background that, you know, I was always poor when I started off. So that was just, just I was just so scared of being poor. And deep down inside, there was this little girl that just wanted to prove that she could survive on her own. So every opportunity to me um, to make money is an opportunity for growth, as long as it doesn't compromise my integrity. That was that was that so, was so, so it was a way for you to make money and make more money. But did you think do you think that sidetracked you, or in, in, on hindsight, would you do that again, or you wouldn't? You know, when I was younger, the drive was make money. I can make extra money. Okay, I'll do I'll do it. I I don't know how to do it. I, if I, even if I didn't know how to do it, I would learn it because I would make extra bucks. Survival mode. But then as I grew older, I realized that, okay, you run a business, great. Uh, but then, you know, you, you need to create extensions of your business, right? Touch points. And obviously, networking is key. It's not what you know, it's who you know. So I took the opportunity to do things that I wasn't typically comfortable of doing, being in social environments and doing all these things because I thought that would be a great investment towards the bigger picture. Always think big, right? Always think about the bigger picture. And right now, um, part of the work that I do involves Japan, um, investment holdings in Japan. But that would not have been possible if I had not undertook the opportunity to go there and actually look for a job there in, in music. So plus, plus, you have a million fans in Japan. No, now, right? so, no, no. But you know, so so I, you know, you know, to close out this segment, you know, one of the things is there are a lot of people, especially those watching on Facebook, I think, who who say, I want to be like Hannah Tan. You mm. know, um, if you know, a lot of young people want to stardom, they want fame, they want glamour, they, they want all these things. Uh, you you don't seek it out. You instead seek to be an entrepreneur, to make a difference, to impact the world. Mm. Um, what sort of advice would you give these young people who who want young to be people. like you, and yet at the same time? Um, you recommend not being like you, you know. You know. <laughs> so, so what sort of advice would you give them if you were to give advice to these wow. guys? Wow, um, I, I had the opportunity to learn a lot of things. Um, I would say, you know, we can't have a million dollar dream with a minimum wage work ethic. 
Don't make it your goal to be successful. Make it your goal to be disciplined and success will follow. So I want to challenge all the young people out there to do something today that your future self will thank you for. Because a year from now, a lot of us would have wished that we had started today. And if we are willing to learn, nobody can stop us. I mean, I promise you that the journey to, to success, in whatever definition it is, will not be easy. But don't give your past or your present circumstances the, the, the opportunity to define your future. And, and don't compare your timing with someone else's. That's very important. Walk in your own pace, in your own journey, in your own timing, and embrace it because you'll get there too eventually if you keep going. And when you feel like you're about to break, push a little harder so you can break through. Because we shouldn't downgrade our dreams to match our reality. We should upgrade our faith to match our destiny. And I hope that's... You know, you know, I, 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 you're one of the few people who have done, who is doing business in Japan. Mm. I mean, you've got, you've got organizations there, and you, and you work there. But one of the things you did, which is very unique, um, is that you learned Japanese yep. and you speak fluent Japanese. You speak perfect no. Japanese. I mean, pretty good <laughs> Japanese. Learning. Pretty good, you know, better than me, uh, right? <laughs> so, but it took a lot of effort to learn a new language. Yeah. And I recently met the CEO of Touch and Go, Nizam, and he told me he's going to pitch to Alibab, uh, to Jack Ma, mm. and he's learning Mandarin because he wow. wants to pitch in Mandarin. Yep. And I'm noticing that more and more, it takes, you, you really got to go inside, when you go into a new country, yeah. you really got to go yeah. deep inside the yeah, country. Immerse, is, yeah. that, is that something you would advocate for, for people here who are trying to go to new markets? Yeah. Um, how do you succeed in foreign markets? I think you need to understand uh, their language, the culture, understand what how they think, uh, uh, embrace their mindset. Um, when I went to Japan, I was given six months to read, write, and converse in Japanese, and that was tough, but I suppose when your why is strong enough, anything is possible. And, 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 and you shouldn't let anything discourage you um, from, from going and, and uh, achieving your ambition. Absolutely. So, Instead of uh, Arigato, I've got one last, uh, one last question uh, for you. Now, we're addressing a group of SME business owners, CEOs, and, and, uh, and, and managing directors, mm. or, or leaders of, of SMEs, right? If you were to impart one piece of advice to them, and you, you, got, you have a couple of SMEs or a couple of businesses, small businesses that you run yourself, what sort of advice, what sort of insight would you impart to them? Uh, would you give them to say, hey, you know, this is, my, this is what I learned, and yeah. I'd like to impart them to you? So what pearls of wisdom would you throw their way? I would say... Go where the people are. A very intelligent man once said, and I quote, when it comes down to it, the people of this world speak social media. And what that means is that any CEO, COO, or C-level executive will need to be fluent in social media in order to keep their companies relevant. I mean, executives understand that their time and their financial investments need to go where people are spending time, and that's social media. So activate as many employees as you can to scale genuine engagements and, and secure surface area, but use paid media to amplify your investments over time. Uh, develop social equity, aka earn media, because that contributes to the bottom line of most businesses today. Um, most importantly, <laughs> make an income while making an impact and keep your moves silent, your money invested, your life low key, and your prayers even louder. <laughs> All right, very good. We've been speaking to Hannah Tan, Quibo Group, here on the Ambank Biz Club Show. Let's give a warm uh, applause so to Hannah Tan. Thank you. Hannah, thank you again thank you for so being much. here on our show with us. Thank you.